All right, guys, welcome back to the MVM show. I'm Titus, my co-host Thomas here today, and we got some gentlemen here from Q that I'm excited to have on the show today. Um, if you're watching this, you can uh, watch it on YouTube on the MVM show channel. You can also uh, check it out on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, all those platforms. So, But if you want to see it, see the video of it, you can go on YouTube. So w- today I have Kevin Wilkerson, which is the vice president of brand marketing, and then I also have Sean Ayers, that is the business unit director. Guys, nice to have you on the show today. Good to be yeah, here. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah, we're ex- we're excited that this topic. Um, I'm really stoked to have you guys on and talk about this, but I think we'll just go ahead and uh, get right into it. And first off, uh, Kevin, why don't you kind of introduce yourself and and kind of about yourself and what you do and where you came from? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so yeah, you said I'm Kevin Wilkerson, and uh, I'm a Kuyu team member, and um, you know I've been at Kuyu for quite a few years now, and I live in Wyoming, so uh, I have the joy of being a remote employee, and so uh, you know I'm a big Western big game hunter. I've uh, been known to hunt some waterfowl uh, in my younger years, and recently on the Bighorn River here in Wyoming, but uh, you know just the Kuyu team is just a phenomenal team to be a part of, and especially what we're talking about today. Really excited to be here. All right. Thank you. Sean, what about yourself? Yeah, I've been fortunate uh, to be part of the Kuyu team uh, since 2011. Uh, so been here for the full journey, the full ride. I uh, got a chance to work with amazing people like, like Kevin, um, build some great product over the years. Uh, I'm definitely like an avid waterfowl hunter. That's kind of how I, how I started out. I mean, it's, I think I think I'm like 43 years in now at this point. So uh, so yeah, it's been wow. hunting ducks for a long time at this point. But awesome, uh, awesome. but yeah, I grew up hunting the Klamath Basin up in Oregon. Grew up in Oregon. Um, came to school down in California, and uh, actually worked as a research scientist for almost 20 years. But then uh, got an opportunity to get into uh, product design, uh, and definitely passionate about about mountain hunting. But actually, all types of hunting. I mean, it's okay. you know anything from, you know, turkeys to waterfowl. Um, we definitely hunt a lot of ducks though here in the, you know, in the winter, once a lot of the game seasons are closed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's awesome. Uh, so kind of wanted to start off from, I guess the beginning is how did it, how did it all start with Kuyu? And what was did, behind the objective behind it and how did it all begin? I mean, I've heard some different stories, but it'd be nice oh. to hear straight from you guys. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Do you, Sean. do you want me to? Do you want me to start that? Okay. Yeah. No. And I, um, you know, I was, like I said, I was fortunate to have kind of a behind the scenes, uh, you know, journey through this whole thing with uh, the founder Jason Harrison, and uh, a good friend of mine played football with him, uh, hunted with him. He actually got me into backcountry uh, uh, hunting, uh, primarily archery hunting. This was pre, honestly, pre even him starting Sitka. So, uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, going through like the, the history of, a, essentially back, you know, in the early two thousands, the, the hunting space did not have adequate, uh, you know, performance gear for guys doing backcountry hunting. And, uh, and that, you know, we're there, a lot of it was just price point, um, cheap, cheap fabrics, cottons, things that would kill you in the mountains, honestly. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so, you know, a lot of a lot of serious sheep hunters, a lot of guys doing backcountry hunts were wearing, you know, product from from outdoor companies. And uh, and there was definitely a need there. Uh, Jason stepped up, you know, Sitka started back in those days. Uh, but then as uh, as as he transitioned out of, out of Sitka, I mean, there was an opportunity there to take performance to the next level. And that's uh, and that was a combination really of, you know, smart choices about fabrics. It was a combination of uh, a consumer direct business model that allowed us not to build to price points. You basically cut out that retail markout and all of a sudden you have so much more flexibility with what you can build. Like, you know, I remember, I remember Jason back in the day saying, you know, saying, Hey, like, you know, I get introduced to these incredible fabrics from Tori in Japan. But there's just no way that it, that pencils out to use uh, and sell it through a retail outlet like Cabela's, and so um, so that was a that was an amazing opportunity to you know 
build a product that was of higher quality uh, in, uh, yeah, and that he took advantage of it, was, was kind of, uh, had a lot of foresight in terms of a consumer direct relationship, not only on a product level, but then on a, you know, a, a customer level too in the relationship. And I think like Kevin could follow up a lot on, on that and elaborate on, on that side of it. Yeah. You know, what's really, I always like to think about this and we're kind of just BS in here, but you know, nowadays when you say direct to consumer, it's fairly rep, like everyone knows what that is. And, mm -hmm. you know, you've got the Amazons of the world and, and all these other places that are doing this. But if you really put yourself back to 2011, uh, man, that was a pretty wild thing. Uh, not, not only, and I, I say that specifically for the hunting industry, you know, other, other brands, you know, other mainstream brands might've been doing that stuff, but you know, we still to this day hold true and we hold close that we were the first direct to consumer brand in the hunting space. And that mm -hmm. allowed us to be the top of the spear of innovation and continues to allow us to do that today. You know, you've seen uh, maybe a couple brands do the same thing uh, in the space, but they still didn't start that way. And so we have that much more um, runway behind us that produces the success that we see in front of us when it comes to the okay. direct consumer model. Hmm. And, you know, obviously, yeah. you know, um, Sean knows all that history uh, way more than me because he lived it. But, you know, mm -hmm. when you also think about, you know, definitely started out as a sheep hunting brand and, st and still we consider ourselves an ultralight hunting, you know, even, even the new categories that we're getting in Sean and team are absolutely phenomenal at making those products ultralight. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. sometimes you're like, Oh, well, why do I need an ultralight stationary jacket? Well, it's because you move better um, because mm -hmm. the materials are better. The insulations are better. And so ultimately mm -hmm. that's just going to make you feel better and let you be more comfortable longer. So, that thread of ultralight, even though we're in talking about new categories today, still stands true to what the PD team does on a daily basis. Mm. Yeah. And I don't think people even really realize that unless they've tried it because, um, I mean, just one of the pieces I have, one of the puffy pieces is like, <laughs> I was on a hunt last year and my dad sitting next to me and he's got this super thick jacket on and he's freezing. And I have this puffy that weighs all of, you know, a couple ounces. And I'm looking over at him like, I'm warm. You know what I mean? I don't think people, if you haven't tried the product, you know, I don't think they can really appreciate it either. Yeah. You know, funny story that only a few people would know, but we had to start sending follow-up purchase emails to people that bought the original Super Down Ultra because people were getting boxes of super down ultras and they thought they were empty. And so um, they call customer service and try to initiate a return and the box, oh, you know, it goodness. was in the box. And so we had to initiate a, a return email send that said, your box has something in it. Please open it. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, that's kind of funny. Yeah, for the I'm, ultra. I'm sure there was people that pulled the jacket out and was like, this thing's supposed to keep me warm. It, weigh, it doesn't even weigh anything. But then when you try it, it's like, wow, this is awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it, you're just falling back on the product and the performance of the product. One thing that, uh, honestly, I don't think we talk enough about is uh, introducing stretch into all the products like that. Mm. And stretch fabrics that do not contain like spandex and lycra, yeah. like elastanes, because th those materials are heavy they hold water they have slow dry times they stink over time like and so the access to the materials honestly was about was largely about stretch without like spandex or elastane in the fabrics and we still like as much as we can like we hold true to that to this day and uh and it really makes a difference in the performance of those fabrics i think it's it's so funny like our original chugach rain gear had just this incredible amount of stretch to it and five years into, into, you know, Kuyu having Chugach rain gear. I remember like one of the major outdoor brands had this massive marketing campaign about like finally getting stretch rain gear. I mean, we've been doing it for five years at that point. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it wasn't something that was really common and like out of Gore-Tex and, and things like that. And, and you look at the, like the stretch woven fabrics used in our attack pant, for example, like just the composition of that fabric 
you know, makes it not only just resist moisture, but also dry out super fast. And then, you know, and it stretches great. So it's not binding your movement when you're trying to kind of like hike up a super steep hill. Yeah. So for somebody that hasn't maybe tried QE yet or they've seen it, but they haven't made a jump yet, um, what would you guys say that is the biggest separator between you and a lot of other companies? Because there are more and more companies coming out with gear and stuff. Do you, you guys think it's your team? Do you think it's your innovation? Do you think it's the materials? Uh, what what would you guys say? I would say, well, that's really hard. We could talk for a while, right? Um, exactly. Go ahead. I, I would, <laughs> Go ahead. I would, I would say, I, I would say two things. Um, I would say our, our our incredibly strong brand, and by that, what I mean is, is we're about hunters, um, and so we're you know one thing we like to say is we like to keep hunters hunting and so you know we don't really mess around with the stuff external from hunting i i hope people notice that um we stay very very laser focused on what our goals are and they're still the same today uh than they were in the past that, that's one thing because you've seen a lot of brands really wanting to do some mainstream stuff and yeah, we want to grow, but we also want to stay true to who we are as the brand mm. on Kuyu. I think that's important. Yeah. Um, yep. Yes. And then I would say equally as important is the the true innovation that takes place with the PD team on a daily basis. Um, you know, I I, yeah, I got to stop myself from talking because it's, it's very hard to not be somewhat biased, but. Uh, you know, you think about some of the stuff that Kuyu came out with in the beginning, and Sean touched on it, four-way mechanical stretch. It's a huge thing that nobody was doing. And, like, full-length zips on on bottoms. Kuyu came up with that one. Uh, hip zips. Should have probably patented that one. Um, yeah, I agree. Like, um, <laughs> there's a lot of items that nobody would be like, oh, man, Kuyu did that. But you know what? Mm -hmm. Kuyu, they legitimately did. So... Yeah. If you look at the true product innovation that happens and still happens on a daily basis, including what we're talking about today, um, that's one thing. Oftentimes today, people talk about innovation, but oftentimes a lot of those brands are just copying brands that came before them. Yeah. Agreed. 100%. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, and just, so, I mean, to follow up. Talked about, you know, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say to follow, you know, follow up on that a little bit. I think there's, you know, I'm, I'm on the product side of the business, so obviously, you know, very focused on always trying to make the best, improve what we got, just, you know, really looking at, at what's coming down the road. Um, I believe our, you know, our materials, our design, like, are best in class. But one thing that one aspect of, and it's, and it's another aspect of this consumer direct business model, is that we have direct access to, our customers from a, and, and Kevin can talk more about this, about you like marketing and feedback from them, like marketing to them and feedback from them. I think the feedback from them, from a product perspective is, is the most, is the most important. I mean, if you look at somebody who's selling through a retail outlet, they don't always hear from the customer. We hear everything from the customer. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, mm -hmm. like, we don't have a typical like pro staff. Like it's, we have a massive guide and outfitters program that we started mm -hmm. initially. And that, and those guys, I mean, all that information is just getting funneled into the product group and we're just getting hammered constantly. <laughs> like if, like if, if something fails, you know, I'm hearing about it from five different guys at the same time. Like it's, you know, we're just getting constantly hammered by, you know, those guys. So we know immediately, like if there's, you know, a concern from customer service or like a warranty issue or something, like it's right down the hall. I just go down and look at the product and can like fix it immediately. You know, if there, if yeah. something comes up, like it's a manufacturing problem or something, you know, like that's such rare, but I mean, it, when it does come up, like we can fix it really quickly being, you know, the way that yeah. the business is structured. Yeah. Yeah. And, and have a direct line of communication. Yeah. yeah. And also to that, sorry, me and Sean could probably go back and forth with this for a while, <laughs> yeah, but exactly. <laughs> along with that, everything he just said talks about how all of our stuff is tested and proven to the highest level. So when we think about that guide and outfitter program and we think about all the testing that goes into products, we legitimately mm -hmm. test those products until failure and then we figure out how to make them better. And mm -hmm. side note, just because I can, um, uh, 
recently a brand released a product that was uh, new to the industry and was tested for two years. We released that product in 2015. Hmm. So they didn't have to test it too long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They already had some proof. There was already proof in the technology when we released it in 2015. Yeah. And that that's one thing I want to definitely get into more uh, a little bit later on too. Some more is the amount of gear testing you guys go. I'm really kind of infatuated with how long that process is and how you go about it. But um, I guess to kind of, I don't want to pull you guys out of this too fast. I mean, if there's more you want to add in, Sean or Kevin, keep going because, I mean, I really like how you guys are talking about all this. Is there anything else that you could add into that that sector? Yeah, but I won't. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be one whole podcast, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, well, then, you know, you talked about QU being founded in 2011. Um, I'm just curious now, and I'm sure a lot of other people are too, is – why now are you getting into the waterfowl space? Yeah, I can, I, I mean, I can take that. I think, you know, it's, <laughs> put it this way, it's not like we haven't been hunting ducks that whole time. Like we have right. been, believe me, <laughs> like, you know, and, <laughs> and, and all those conversations in the marsh a bit about how we could, you know, do things differently, do things better. Um, mm-hmm. it, there was a, there's a confluence of things. Like we're finally to the size where we've got, you know, enough people that we can start focusing on different projects. There was a materials, I could talk more about this later, but there was uh, materials um, innovation that, that really spurred our, our timing on this as well. And that, um, you know, that led into, you know, a lot of the, it's, you know, included in the products, um, some manufacturing techniques that we just became, you know, that we just dove into have now, you know, elevated us into, you know, certain products in the waterfowl space and, uh, yeah, it was just, I mean, it was the right time. We felt like we could, we could continue to, we could focus on this, this new avenue, but still keep, you know, still keep the, the company going and, and focusing on the mountain hunt side, but also take on this, this new, this new avenue. How big of a bite is that to take on this new avenue? I mean, you guys are already so successful and been doing this for a long time. Like you said, it's not like you need it because you guys are doing very well, obviously, but you know, was that hard for you? I mean, is this something you kind of throttled back, like something you've been wanting to do for quite some time and just said, let's put off one more year? You know, how did that kind of look? Well, it's definitely something we've been doing, wanting, wanting to do for a long time. It's just, you know, it's just getting, making sure we had the right materials, the right technologies, the, you know, enough time to test it. Like, you know, I said that the ability to, the manpower here to, you know, build it and test it and, and, and all those things. It was just, it was, it's the right time now. So, yeah, we're mm-hmm. super excited. Yeah, us too. <laughs> oh, man. I, <laughs> I'm trying to keep quiet, but, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is awesome. Um, so, like I said a little bit earlier, it seems like a lot of people have kind of jumped into waterfowl, making a little bit more specialty things. Um, I, I'm sure I know your answer, but to someone, like I said, who may have not tried Kuyu yet? Um, do you see any any major things that is going to stand out to maybe somebody, the guy that's been duck hunting for 10, 15, 20 years? Do you do you feel like there's things in the waterfowl line that you guys are introducing that's going to separate you guys significantly from from other companies? Absolutely, yeah. No, I mean we're we're super excited. Honestly, I think you know there's some of the like some of these products is some of the you know, new most significant innovation we've come out with since the company started, honestly. And so, wow. yeah, we're, we're really excited about, you know, from That's, a material yeah. standpoint, a design standpoint. Uh, and like overall, I mean, you, you guys obviously are big time waterfowl and iron, you know how important like durability is, how important mm-hmm. moisture management is. But, you know, one thing that we, that we focused on a lot was back to our core roots, like stretch, right? Like having, like how many guys make a make a make an outer jacket that's completely bomb proof, but still has some stretch characteristics or, you know, there's there's certain areas in our way that has stretch characteristics. So it's like um, insulation with great stretch. And we can get into more specifics on the product, but stretch, I mean, super incredibly windproof and, and durable materials. I mean, but still at an ultra lightweight and stuff that dries really, really quickly. 
And you've mentioned stretch a couple times, but it, it, like I said, if you haven't experienced it, you can't almost appreciate the fact of the stretch because that stretch translates into better hunting, better movement, better, you know, technique in, you know, it, there's so many other things that that will do for you alone. Just that right there. Sure. Yeah. And, and right. you know, not only that, you know, a, a lot of people say stretch, but when we say it, we really do mean it from a mechanical perspective, from a way that it was made more so than the addition of a spandex or something along those lines that, you know, you, you can find stretch in a lot of materials, but what happens when that stretch gets wet and doesn't handle moisture well, and, um, you know, you're sweating in it and it doesn't handle, like, there's so many ways where stretch can be a negative if not done correctly. So I think sometimes people experience stretch with other garments, but but then that also comes with a downside. Very rarely do people experience stretch unless they're using the right materials and fabrics and experience the stretch with all the good stuff that comes with it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, let, that, let, that kind of leads us right into this next question. And um, take your time. I mean, we don't want to rush through anything, but I really, <clears throat> when we went there, uh, the other week and got to put our hands on and touch and feel and look at the product. I mean, it just raised the excitement level fivefold. But I'd like to get into the specifics on the pieces you guys are offering in the waterfowl line. That's, um, I, I think this is the one of the meat and potatoes part of this podcast that a lot of people are curious. What are you guys offering? Let's hear some specifics. Want me to go ahead and dive in, Kev? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we wanted to not piecemeal this. We wanted to come in, out with a, a full lineup, uh, skin to shell layering system uh, that you can get from Kuyu. Really good waterfowl backpack in that lineup as well. Uh, you know, base, base layers, mid layers, insulation, hard shell. I mean, it's essentially how, you know, kind of, kind of how we started into like, the sheep hunting world, like just, you know, just there are a lot of parallels in the way that that you need to layer for waterfowl hunting, especially and, and especially for active waterfowl hunting. I mean, there's a different types of waterfowl. I mean, you guys know that well. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, yeah. you know, and, and waterfowl hunting is one of those things that, you know, obviously you target the worst weather possible, but then also your activity level can go from like zero to 100 in no time, you know. You know, you might be doing that, oh, that, yes. that that public land race out to the X or something like that in the mm -hmm. morning. And then you sit down and you, you know, like yep. winds blowing, cold, wet, storm right. comes in, like, you know, chasing down birds, just the whole, you know, the whole, the whole yeah. gamut. Like it, there's, there can be a massive swing in, yeah. in moisture level, not only externally, but internally. And so mm -hmm. like just being able to manage that well is something that we really, really focused on. Right. Like, and that's. Yeah. You know, it's it's something we've had years of experience in in, in the the mountain hunting space and, and figuring out how to apply that properly to uh, to the to the waterfowl space was was a big big goal of, of this lineup. Uh, from I a, never thought about I never thought about that comparison of that because if you're sheep hunting and I haven't been sheep hunting, um, got some friends that are guides and do it all the time, but you go from hiking and sweating big time to sitting down and glassing for hours. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I'm not comparing the two because that, trust me, that's extreme and you're up on 12,000 feet, 15,000 feet, whatever. But at the same time, like you said, you could be dry as a bone, it could be 50 degrees, and then 45 minutes later, it's dumping rain and the temperature drops, and then you're chasing the bird down and you're sweating. Then you're sitting down again and there's an hour break between any flight. So. <laughs> Yeah. There is, like you said, a roller coaster, and I never thought about comparing those two together, but it makes complete sense. You guys already have that figured out. Yeah, exactly. And, and you, so and just like, jump on a boat go and you're going 30 miles an hour. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Jump on a boat and you're going 30 miles an hour, freezing. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 So those are exactly the challenges you're trying to, you know, trying to overcome. And uh, you know, from a from a base layer perspective, we actually felt like we were pretty well covered. Like it's, you know, we've got some really good base layers. I mean, I personally love to have a, a hooded base layer for waterfowl, just, uh, you know, 
still hear really well, but just have a little bit of camouflage coverage, just a little bit of, of warmth. And so, you know, something like a Merino base layer, like a like our 120 LT Ultra Merino, uh, just awesome, or our 145 hooded, like one of those pieces, uh, just incredible as a as a base layer. And, you know, Merino wool, thermoregulating, uh, great moisture management, you know, it feel, feels good even, what, you know, feels the same basically whether it's wet or dry, like it's, you know, it's amazing material. Yeah. Uh, we've got synthetic base layers too that that uh, you know are are you know even more durable and uh, and and perform amazingly well too. So didn't dive too much into that space. Uh, really started with uh, with a set of mid layers, and we've got a collection uh, called our strong fleece, and it's really it's a it's a fabric collection, and it's a it's a it's a hard faced fleece with a really high loft brushing on the backside, and so in the in the waterfowl space we came out with a a full zip jacket, uh, non-hooded, and then a layering pant that works amazingly well, like under, under waders. And uh, and specifically, like like you said, we've got we've got a similar product in 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 mountain hunt space, but it's like hybridize it in places like this. We we went mainly with, you know, like it, it, there's waterfowl hunting. A lot of times you're sitting there with the back your back to the wind, so you don't want to have a thinner fabric on the back of your of your you know mid layer, for example. So, you know, targeted like fabric combinations uh, to, to work really well, specifically for waterfowl. Um, that fabric, just incredibly durable. You can basically beat it up, just, you know, like basically any pant type of material uh, or jacket material really almost functions like a soft shell and has a really good DWR on it. So, and, and it also stretches really well without any elastin in it. So, um, you know, so it like, it'll pass moisture through really well. If it does get wet, it dries out really quick. Like it just, you know, it performs really well. And so, like I said, there's a full full zip jacket that's a great, you know, layering piece. You can put that over a base layer, you know, temperatures that are, you know, 50 degrees, something, you know, 50s and some, you know, temperatures like that. I mean, perfect, basically jacket slash mid layer to use. And then the, the layering pan actually has um, stirrups built into them. That, that you can you can actually use the stirrups or they they really really easily just fold up uh, on you know the back of your Achilles and, and there's really tight uh, well fitted pant just awesome under under waders and like honestly like I spent a ton of days last year um, you know and, and the year before actually testing that that out and like I was amazed at the the versatility temperature wise I thought for sure it was going to be you know way too hot and you know. 50 something degree temperatures to wear that pant, but it was like, it was really versatile, like down to, you know, freezing temperatures mm. through the mid fifties, like just kind of, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the temperatures you get in, in, you know, typical, typical waterfowl hunt. Um, so that, yeah. So that layering pant and that, uh, and that, that strong fleece uh, full zip jacket are, are two pieces that are, that are waterfowl specific. Uh -huh. And then anything you want to add on that, Kevin, or just? Uh... Um, I would just add that the layering pant kind of fits more a little bit like a well-fit sweatpant, has pockets on the sides and has a drawstring yep. on the front. Um, so I know a lot of people when they were wear testing it were coming out of waders and going into a gas station with them. And like, uh -huh. you know, like you could wear them around and nobody would really good point. look at you weird. But, um, you know, like, especially if you were in a I know why you're saying that, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, nobody would be like, this dude's wearing some, like, base layer bottoms. Um, yeah. yeah. They look more like a, a well-fitting sweatpants. They're not baggy under a waiter, mm -hmm. but um, they look fine if you don't have the waiter on. And then, yeah. <laughs> really, that strong fleece item, I'll just mention that, you know, we have a strong fleece category of products in the mountain hunting lineup and it's just such a good lineup of products it's hard to find a fleece as durable as this one and especially this one specifically i believe most of the products airs a walk through were all really thought out from a waterfowl perspective so that that strong fleece 290 had i think it's cut about a, a little bit shorter than a normal one in case you're layering under waders um so mm. it's got a little bit of a smaller um a shorter waistline on it to accommodate for when you're layering in a waterfowl specific situation. But um, yeah, that's a, those are great pieces. Yeah. Certainly didn't go full, like, like 
like waiter length or anything like that, but but uh, but they are just a little bit shorter than the mountain hunt pieces. And, and all of those outerwear pieces also have um, you know, really good constrictors on them so that you can you can constrict around your, around your waist and you could you could potentially you know you could you could fold up uh, the hemline of the jacket or a mid layer any of the any of the pieces mm. we've got that what's one the, thing to, what's some of the go ahead. go ahead go ahead no you go ahead no I was just gonna say like one other thing we, we did throw some, we did throw hip vents in there which is something we put in all of our pants oh, yeah. and you know gives you a little more breathability inside of waiters but also like you take those off like like Kevin's saying you're wearing them afterwards or say you're you know, say you're wearing them under a, a heavy duty rain gear, like in a field hunting type of situation, right? Then you can you you could you could ventilate. You say you're setting out a big big set of goose spread or something like that. You can ventilate your rain gear. You can ventilate your your layering pant, you know, and just get a good airflow coming through every time you move. Yeah, yeah. On the uh, yeah, I've seen the pants. The pants looked sweet, and like you said, uh, I don't know how to say that very. <laughs> I, you know, there's some underpants that I've wore with some companies that you're kind of, like you said, almost embarrassed to go in the convenience store to grab a soda or something because you look like you're a rapper. <laughs> you just, it's just not something you'd want to go around in the public too much. But anyways, uh, that was a little sidetrack there. But um, on the jacket, the, the waterproof jacket, um, can you tell me, I don't want to do it for you, but there were some features that I seen on that that I thought was a pretty, it was a great idea um, that you had, you know, the cuffs, the, the all that stuff. I'll let you tell us about some of the details on that. Yeah. Is there any particular order you guys want me to go into? Cause like we, we've got insulation to go into, we've got waiter, we've got, we've got, you know, a hard shell, hard shell piece. Uh, well, yeah, let's do that because we'll get into more details about the waiter in just a little bit, but yeah, let's start with, uh, let's start with the insulation and then, then go to the outer and then we'll kind of dip into the, uh, maybe the waiter in a little bit kind of separately. Yeah. So the insulation base is honestly, this is one of the things I think we're almost all of us are most excited about. Uh, we've got a vest and a hooded jacket and the fabric for that has uh, baffles that are actually woven into the fabric. So you've got no stitch lines in there that can catch on brush and potentially get, you know, get pulled. You've got, um, there are, it's also hundred percent windproof, right? Cause you don't have the stitching that's going through the baffles and then, but the baffles are filled with a, a synthetic insulation that, uh, we went with synthetic versus down in this case for a couple different reasons. Um, these are incredible layering pieces and, and this synthetic insulation that we're using, it's a, a fiber ball insulation, uh, from Torre incredible water resistance, but also a ton of compression resistance. So if you're using like, if you're layering it underneath a hard shell, or if you're doing multiple layers over the top, like it retains a ton of loft and is incredibly warm for the weight. And then, like I said, it just like, it handles moisture amazingly well, uh, just in terms of, you know, if you would happen to, you know, get it wet, it just, you know, keeps its loft, keeps its warmth. And the stretch of this fabric is just just unbelievable. So um, you know, there's just no restriction to, you know, overhead shooting, just moving in it. Like it's just it's just effortless. And with those outer layer pieces, with the with with those the insulation pieces, and then the hard shell, uh, we went with a like a double pocket configuration. So you've got a standard hand pocket, but then we also went with an upper pocket that is fleece lined with like a heavy sherpa fleece. And so if you're wearing that underneath the waiter, right, you can just kind of slip your hand over the top of the waiter, hand falls right into those, those pockets, just incredibly warm. But part of that, like we were really, really careful to make sure that that is not going to hang up on the butt of a shotgun when you, when you, when you pull up. So, mm. um, so those pockets like have mag magnetic closures. Like we literally like designed the pocket, the angle of the pocket that like the position of the pocket, like everything was designed around not catching a gun. And so, you know, that like magnetic closure just boom, pops closed. And then you just, you literally cannot catch, catch a gun on it. So you've got these pockets that are incredibly functional, but, but also like you're not going to inhibit like any, any shooting opportunity you have. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Uh, am, am I mistaken on that? Did it have uh, the pit vents too on that? I can't We remember. did. Yeah. Yeah. We put that in okay. the, in the hooded jacket. So 
once again, just a feature that you don't often see in 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 the waterfowl space. But uh, you know, there like like we were saying before, there's a ton, ton of times where you're doing a lot of activity waterfowl hunting, and being able to just ventilate like that is 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 a huge plus. I love that. There's so many things that you guys can bring over from big game that the typical waterfowl guy has no like. I guess n just real no experience, but like especially you guys as a clothing, you know, you know, premium clothing company for hunters. Like, there's so many that you can bring over to waterfowl that's been used in big game for a while. Like, I, I mean, I've used some big game pieces for waterfowl just because it's better, you know. So that's that's gonna be awesome. Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah, you know the the flyway specifically, which what Sean was just talking about, uh, is my favorite item out of the lineup. But I, yeah. the way that it fits is just so smooth, feels great, really nice arm taper, so that it doesn't it doesn't feel like you're going to be bogged down with the arm taper. And then also just the styling of it looks great. And so this. You know, whether you're wearing our solids, which we're coming out with multiple solids in all of these pieces except for the waiter. Um, you know, if you're wearing our solids with this with this top, it's gonna look it's gonna look top notch. And also we do have a gasket on the front of the sleeve on the flyway. So um now can you can you explain what the flyway is, Kevin? For those listening? The flyway is the insulated jacket that Sean was just talking about. So okay. It's okay. going to be a flyway insulated jacket and the flyway vest. We have both options. One obviously has and arms. Which would be other. which would be considered the the uh, waterproof one, correct? The the waterproof. Oh, uh, I'm sure. That's Ayer, the puffy one, right? That's the puffy. Yeah, the flyway yeah. is a puffy. Okay. Um, yeah, commonly referred to as puffies. And then yeah. um, Ayers, if you want to walk through the HD Storm Show, because that you know you talk well, about innovation. Let me. Let me jump okay. in right here because I thought that's what he was talking about, but I wasn't sure. So it makes because I know you were talking about the insulation on that, but you bring that up, Kevin. I when I put my arm through that sleeve because you couldn't tell from looking on the flyweight jacket that that cuff was in there. Well, when I went slipped my hand through and that thing locked around, I was like, "Oh my goodness, <laughs> these guys <laughs> thought of everything!" <laughs> like because just because you know. I know there's people that have the, the puffies and stuff like that, and then that's just what we're referring to. Sorry. Yeah, but no, no, you're right. <clears throat> yeah. it, you still, if you grab a decoy and it's not ran in and you don't have the waterproof jacket on, you raise your arm, now you've got a soaking wet arm, and that's one of the most frustrating things for every waterfowl, but no one's ever really made a lot of effort to, like, take care of that issue. And, like, by you guys putting that on there, I was like, that's ingenious. Like, why has no one done that yet before? And it's not even noticeable because once it goes through and you fold it back, I mean, you don't even know it's there. And props to you guys for that idea, honestly, because I thought that was just like one of the kind of made the light bulbs go off in my head. Yeah, I should have clarified the name like but, yeah, uh, on it. But yeah, that yeah, that the flyway flyway jet vest and both of those are like. The vest is an incredible layering piece, right? You can layer it underneath. You can layer it underneath the flyway jacket. And then the HD Storm Shell, you can put it over the top of a strong fleece. Like for California, like that, that's the one, honestly, that I use of the insulation that I use probably the most. It just, you know, it's just this great, like great layering piece that's that's just incredibly warm for the weight. And like I said, it just, yeah, it just, it just adds a, adds a ton of value. Yeah. Yeah. And the po the pocket design, all that's the same on both, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. There's and even then, exterior so pockets on there and that, that are outside of the, the hand pockets. Uh, there's an interior pocket. There's like, we went heavy on the pockets on all this waterfowl yeah. stuff because we know, I mean, there's <laughs> guys are, you know, you know how many things you're throwing mm -hmm. in those, those different gear. pockets. So, yeah, yeah makes a, a difference. Mm -hmm. So, Kevin, you were talking about the, the next piece. What were you yeah, saying? No, I was telling, you know, Ayers, I, HD Storm Shell, uh, HD Flex Storm Shell, which is our, which is our, you know, out, outside waterproof piece, but one of the, the biggest innovation items of this whole lineup. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so that HD Storm Shell, uh, HD Flex Storm Shell, I think this is a, I was talking about materials innovation before. 
like this is a material that we've been working on for four, maybe even five years now, trying to get exactly the right, you know, face fabric combination, the right laminate combinations, just backer combinations, seam tapes, like just all of those things. Um, been testing it in, you know, rain gear form and, and just like all of these things. And so uh, we finally you know, came upon a, a combination that we were really confident in. And this is like by far the most durable rain gear that, that Kuyu's going to launch. I mean, probably ever. Like it's like it is, wow. it is, it's a really, really tightly woven face fabric that uh, that's just incredibly puncture resistant as well. And yeah. so, um, yeah, that like the testing characteristics are kind of, you know, off the charts. And I mean, if you're into like things like waterproof rating, like we've got a 50,000 millimeter waterproof rating on it, but it is still breathable. And it has some stretch characteristics to it also that, uh, which is really unusual in a fabric that's that durable. Wow. Wow. Oh, and, sorry guys. No, no worries. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Just, I guess from, you know, it's kind of from a features uh, standpoint, we put some really burly zippers on there. We externally mounted all the pockets. So it's got the same upper hand pockets that's on the flyway that are fleece line. So, I mean, you can, if you're, you know, you put your hands up high, if you're in a seated position or something, trying to crouch down, you can keep your, keep your hands warm and dry. Um, the, it's got a set of lower pockets. It's like a, that's a flat pocket with uh, bellows on it. So you can dump a box of shells in there. You can also, the flap is designed to fold inside. If you want to just, you know, if you wanted to keep a, a box of shells in there, for example, uh -huh. And then all of those pockets are also, they sit high on the jacket so that you've got probably at least six inches of space below that if you're wearing this as a wading jacket outside of a wader, you can cinch the, the hem on it and just fold it under. And then you all of a sudden, now you've got wading length. Now you've got a wading length jacket, but you've got a jacket that you can use, not just, you know, want to use it, not oh, just for waterfowl, yeah, or right. if you want to use it for, you know, a field hunt, for example, you know, you want that a little bit of extra length, mm -hmm. you don't, you got the best of both worlds. And so yeah. like, if I'm wearing it outside a waiter, like a lot of times, like I'll leave it cinched up and just and fold under and you can, and you can literally have it be way up at your, at your waist level. Hmm. That's smart. Really smart. That's awesome. And then yeah, I have like a no. neoprene, neoprene gaskets on the cuff. Uh, yep. Definitely got pit zips in there drop away hood like a neck constrictor uh cord around the neck so you can really cinch down if you're not wanting to wear your hood but you're you know trying to get through that you know some light rain but just i mean performance wise like you guys know what last winter was like right like it was yeah. it was it was some awesome testing conditions around here for for that that <laughs> piece and like no i kidding. i mean i've never been so dry like in in an all day sideways you know sideways rain it was it was pretty cool uh, wow. Yeah. What'd you do? How'd you, I'm just curious how you design something like say for the head, the hood, turning your head. How do you make that again? It, I guess it goes back to stretch probably, right? To like where that goes with you instead of you turn your head and now you're, you got that whole hood in front of your face blocking your vision. Yeah. And that's a super good question. A lot of that comes out into, um, just design and thinking about those things when you're fitting the garment, like and how you and how you just like how you design it. Like you know, do you, you know do you take the pattern and you cut it back a little bit so you have better better visibility, or do you put a cinch cord at the back? I've got a cinch cord at the back that basically can pull the fabric back and the sides. So you have you know you have better visibility, mm. but trying to keep like a good enough uh, brim on it, right? That that water is not going to fall from here down into the into the neck of the jacket. So. There's a lot of like small details like that that go into the fitting side of it and just like the tweaking, the patterning uh, that. Yeah, I mean, we're and then like overhead shooting also is another thing like this piece definitely has like a ton of articulation built into it. So literally you can just, you know, raise your raise your raise your arms over your head. No problem. No binding, no lifting at all. So just for those overhead shots, it's going to be it's going to be effortless. Huh. What what other uh, pieces uh, besides the waders? Is there anything else in there too that I'm trying not to move along too fast here? Yeah, no yeah. problem. Anything else you want to talk about on Storm Shell, Kevin? That you can think of? 
No, no. I would say that, you know, we kind of have two more items to talk about. One of them is almost an entire new category. Um, yeah. But um, let's talk. I'll, we'll, I'll, I'll jump into that after after we talk about waiters. I think waiters probably okay. the okay. item. Do you want to cover backpack okay. first, Kevin, you think? Or I think you should go sure. dive into yeah. waiters. What would you guys hear yeah. about? Backpack? Yeah, let's do, yeah, let's hear the backpack. Okay. Yeah. That thing was sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, the backpack in general – is coming essentially in a whole in a whole new lineup of submersible bags. Well, a welded collection of submersible bags. So airtight, watertight, waterproof. You can dunk them, which I don't know if you can dunk one because they're airtight, so they hold air on the inside. <laughs> um, we tried to get a couple to sink to take some photos, and it ain't happening. Um, <laughs> but you know, I personally am super excited about these bags, uh, not only from a waterfowl perspective. Um, with the Delta Storm, but from the perspective of the Kodiak lineup too, where we've yeah. got a uh, 3,000 and a 6,600 that are just going to be so versatile for not only waterfowl when you're on a boat or, you know, whenever you're wanting to have something float behind you um, in a waterfowl situation, but also on the bush planes and in a camp environment where you've got gear yeah. that you can leave outside yeah. of your tent. Um, you know, all, all of that stuff these bags right here, I've, I've been waiting on for a while. And so I, I'm thrilled about <laughs> these, but you know, that's kind of, I've been waiting too, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting too. You know, and I'll also, <laughs> you guys need to quit doing so much testing. It's taking a little bit too long. You know, and also I will say as an industry first, before I hand this over to Ayers, because this is really his baby, but as an industry first, I know that it will be, I think the first ones to do a submersible bag in a print. So, the yeah. bags will be available in um, in all three patterns that we have. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. They, look, yeah, they yeah. look pretty slick too. So yeah, yeah, I'll vouch for that. I've seen them. <laughs> but I'll let Ayers dive into it because it's really. I mean, this is Ayers' baby. So yeah, the name of the product is the Delta Storm Twenty Two Hundred, and a really waterfowl focused backpack. It can certainly, you know, cross over in any kind of boat based hunt, but, but really like this was really designed for waterfowl hunters and honestly designed for guys that are, that are spending a hell of a lot of time, like not in an established blind, like, you know, literally getting out there in the Thule's, you know, wading deep, like minimal cover, like what do you do with your bag? Right? Like, what do you like? You're either stuffing everything in your pockets, which is annoying, or, you know, your bag's getting wet, it's falling off the tulies, it's going, your dog jumps, it go, you know, you, you guys, you guys know the routine on that. Yep. But like this bag, you can literally like take what you need out of it and you can just drop it and let it float next to you. I mean, that that's the way we that's the way we designed it. And so the construction is a is a fully like radio frequency welded construction. Um, and that's just taking laminate. Uh, TPU laminate fabrics and running a radio frequency through it, like it, it literally like glues the fabric together, with, so there's no stitch lines, and that makes it just you know incredibly airtight. And then you combine that with uh, zippers that are airtight, um, considered submersible zippers. There's a, a company called Tie Zip out of uh, out of Germany that uh, that makes these the zippers we're using. And the Delta Storm has a main compartment and the 2200 is like cubic inches of the pack. So it's kind of a mid range pack. It's definitely big enough that you can put, you know, your like flyway or your HD storm shell inside of there. Uh, you know, all your, all your, all your shells, everything you need for the day, like you can carry it in there. And, and if you have some of that stuff that you're wearing, you can even get like some, some motion decoys in there. There's like, we made it big enough. So it's actually usable in that, yeah. uh, you know, in, in that respect. Um, there are two primary compartments, uh, a main compartment and then a, an outer compartment. So you can segment your gear also, depending on, you know, like how you want to do that. Uh, like design wise, like we really wanted this not to look like a traditional, like, you know, welded backpack. Because typically welded backpacks, yeah. the easy way to make a welded product is just to make it look square and like a rectangle. Because this welding mm -hmm. technology is not like stitching. Like it is super hard to make something look like a traditional backpack, uh, and mm. and you know have all those welded seams. We wanted something that looked great, functioned great, and and honestly, that like 
still like the most exciting part of it is that we wanted some internal organization, but we wanted that internal organization to be completely removable. So like, I mean, you know, say, say you got everything muddy inside and you just need to hose out the inside of your bag. Like you can do that. Right. Yeah. So yeah. there is a, a, a removable organizer inside that unclips comes out of the bag and then can clip to vegetation. Like there's a clip on it. And so you can clip this around like a tree limb or you can clip it in a blind or even around a, a bunch of toolies. And it's got yep. two, like it's got two flat pockets that can, they can hold like two boxes of shells. It's got an upper pocket that you can put all kinds of, you know, calls in, things like that. It's got a long pocket in the back that you can put like a longer goose flute, something like that in, in the back. So, I mean, that that can come out. And then you've got everything you need to actually, you know, to actually hunt right there. And the backpack, you can like, you know, you can leave your food, your water, your insulation, your, you know, maybe your rain jacket, everything like that. And you can just, you know, make sure those zippers are closed and you can just dump it, you know, and and, and let it let it sit there. You don't have to, you don't have to keep it, you don't have to keep it elevated. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, like I said, I seen that, that bag. I mean, it's, it's spot on money and everything that you were saying, all the reasonings behind that is just fits. In fact, my brother, genius brother here, like, what was that three years ago where you bought one of those, you know, semi, they're not submersible. Let's put it that way. But, um, they're cheap. You can get something off Amazon. We've it's used just them. just an Amazon roll top. Yeah. Um, um, waterproof bag. Yeah, and he's like, I like. I watched him just chuck it over there in the toolies. I'm like, man. So we've been using that. So this is just like, fifty million times. That's <laughs> what like I've been having to use while I was waiting for you guys <laughs> to test your bag. Yeah, because everything you're saying, the dog, the toolies, stuff falling in, getting you know, the rain comes in, then it goes away, and just, oh man, it's. That is it's such a, needed. yeah, it's, it's, it's such a, needed a piece. highly needed product. Yeah. It was fun last year. I mean, I was even using it, like letting it sit there float, like setting the, the butt of the gun on it and then just leaning the gun against the toolies, right? Like that. So it's like actually like a, a gun, it could even you'd be a gun stand, you know, if you're out in mm -hmm. super deep water. So, you know, some, mm -hmm. you know, you, like I said, you guys know the drill, you know, it's like, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of times you got to go where there's no cover in order to kill birds. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wow. And then you got your other, your, um, Kodiak. now is, is that considered being those other two bags, the 33,000 and the 6,600? I mean, is that kind of fall under the waterfowl line? I mean, I know you can, like Kevin said, you can use it everywhere for everything, Alaska, wherever you may be, but is that kind of fall in that bracket? Yeah. Yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll be merchandised with, um, waterfowl products for sure okay yeah when we were doing a lot of wear testing uh and not only that when we were doing photography uh, we were using those kodiak bags on the boat for all kinds of stuff so we actually mm. um, found great use for that we were using them in the velo colorway and the guys on the boat in stuttgart loved them so um, i'm assuming there'll be plenty <laughs> of people that buy those because those also come with backpack straps so ultimately i mean you really could um you could use those bags in a multitude of different ways in a waterfowl situation. It's got removable backpack straps. It's got two inside pockets. It's got um, doctor cinches on them. So um, on the on the ends, you're able to open them up so that the zipper length is longer, so you can fit longer items in the duffel. And then once the item's mm. in the duffel, you can cinch down the doctor straps, and it creates it a tighter tighter weight tighter fit. Mm. So. Those bags are going to be really, you know, and I'm going to go ahead and say it, and they're going to come out a couple of days after waterfowl, but we actually have a few large roll top backpacks coming out as well. So you guys were talking about mm. those big roll yeah. tops. They're going to be your roll top on steroids, but um, we do have some of those <laughs> coming out as well in a backpack configuration. Yeah. Oh, sick. What sizes will those be? 1850 and 3000. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Now, on the, uh, I mean, my mind was just thinking of things just how, as a guy does, right? I'm looking at the Delta Storm, then I'm looking at the medium-sized Kodiak, the 3000. I'm thinking, oh, waders, waders, waders could go in that. Or, you know, put the, the stuff you want to keep dry in there. And then the big one, like, oh, for travel. And I told Thomas, I go, you know how, 
how nice will it be like when you're let's say it's january and you're traveling out of state to go duck hunting and you got your gear and all your regular clothes and your underclothes and everything in there for the trip and you don't have to worry about oh it started raining throw you know get our pull over put our stuff inside you don't the worry's not there anymore not only that i you know seeing it in person and feeling it you talk about some serious toughness to this bag i mean not to jump ahead on gear testing but like how tough is are those bags like i mean what do you do to prove the beating that these can take they've held up well <laughs> put it that way like i was like i just got back from my like second round of actually going up to kodiak and and you know hunting for a bunch of days up there and and those those did a pack raft hunt this time and like those those bags were incredible to have there you know duffel bags like putting in the pack raft and and just you know usually leave them outside the tent it rains like crazy just everything stays perfectly dry i mean it's just scenarios like that they're just really versatile yeah i, I oh another thing i wanted to say is i think you mentioned it but maybe to dumb it down a little more unless i'm mistaken on the backpack straps on the kodiak wasn't there you kind of got a neat little system to where it can you can move it right like a, almost like a buckle i don't know how to explain that other than how it adjusts i just think that's an ingenious idea other than can you kind of go into detail about that a little bit more on how that works yeah what made you guys think of yeah, that too I that was, yeah, that was actually, that was actually a cool, like, convergence of design meeting, like, you know, function and, and performance, because we wanted on that, especially on the big, on, well, on the bigger, the bigger bag has a daisy chain system. And mm. so you can, for, for guys with different, like, shoulder widths, or depending on how you want to carry it, like, you can go to different daisy chains, and you can, and you can make it, you know, applicable for wider shoulders or more narrow. And, it turned out like by doing that, like we could lay those daisy chains exactly in alignment with the with the with the direction of force that those backpack straps were were taking. And so now instead of like pulling sideways on a, a daisy chain like with a bunch of pressure, you're pulling in line with it. And so it's like you know that honestly like those are the those are the fun things when you figure them out from a design perspective that really make like this job awesome. Like because you, you and it, it looks cool too, and and you like this convergence of all those things. You're like that worked you know that was that was good you know so yeah it's cool yeah and you what colors will you guys be offering these bags in uh, you mentioned a few yeah it's uh we've got two solid colorways and we've got all three camo patterns in the oh nice in the kodiak yeah. bags yeah okay okay yeah. Um, are we done with that? We move I, I don't know. Is there anything else we? Yeah, have? we don't want to cut you off. Yeah. Is there any other products? Oh, I, I, I personally am so stoked. I know Ayers would agree. Every time he show, every time I've seen those samples over the years for those submersibles, I've gotten so excited. <laughs> you know, uh, just as a as a big game hunt scenario that I've used a uh, submersible bag for in the past was I went on a trip to Alaska and killed an animal and fro had the luxury of freezing the meat in a freezer. And uh, if I put the frozen meat in a submersible bag, like the ones we're coming out with, with dry ice, uh, the airline will let you put that meat because it's it won't leak. You're not gonna get blood everywhere. And mm. um, as long as you leave just the slightest bit of zipper open for the dry ice <laughs> gases <laughs> to expel, yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> if you don't, if you don't do that, uh, that bag might you might test its limit. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I, I've successfully yeah. I've successfully done that twice, um, and so that's like just a really cool usage for that bag as well. Um, yeah. And then another great usage for that bag, you know, I I, I live in Wyoming. And uh, right now I'm doing some scouting and I'm able with the 3000 Kodiak to put it on the back of my four wheeler and not worry about dust getting into my optics. So I've got mm -hmm. all my optics in that 3000 and, mm -hmm. you know, you say submersible and you're like, oh, big deal. But if you think about it, there's so much dust on those roads on the mountain that mm -hmm. if you have an airtight zipper, 
you're, I mean, I literally have all my optics in that bag and they don't ever get dusty. And that's new because even any zipper, you'll find, you'll get dust inside mm -hmm. a zipper, you know, like you'll be like, yeah. how did dust get in here? And yeah. it'll, it'll find a way. So it, it can't penetrate that zipper. So just a couple other weird functions for that whole lineup of bags. Mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely. That's a good point. Okay. So, so just quickly, I, I know you guys talked about your three camo patterns, but the one you guys are going for with your waterfowl line is Velo. Um, we're familiar with it, but if, maybe if someone's not familiar with it, could you give a quick um, description, maybe why you guys decided to use Velo for your waterfowl line? Yeah, we had, a, we had a lot of internal discussion about this and just, uh, you know, it's, it's a bigger question. I mean, does camouflage need to be species based or should it be based on the vegetation that you're hunting in? Like, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a lot of, a lot of companies will try to try to say that it needs to be species based. And like mm -hmm. we developed Velo good, you know, a few years back and specifically for the type of vegetation, you know, colors, contrast, like all of those things, tone, all those things that are, that are really important for camouflage to work. Like, we developed it like for almost exactly the kind of environments that you do a lot of duck hunting in, like, you know, these seasonal wetland environments, like river bottom environments, like, you know, you, you know, timber environment, like those, you know, those and color wise, it's, you know, it really matches in a, in a wide variety of like deciduous uh, vegetation that's already changed color in the fall. Right. So getting a lot of browns, your grass turns yellow, like, in those in those environments, and we started using a duck hunting. We're like, I don't know that we can do better. You know, it's like it, it works great, and so um, mm -hmm. you know, it gives our customers also the opportunity to, you know, mix and match with what they've already got. Right? I mean, like we purpose built like these specific waterfowl products because we thought we could do that product better specifically with waterfowl in mind. But there's plenty, like I was saying, base layers, things like that. There's other pieces, you know, in the lineup that, you know. Like, why not give our customers the opportunity to use what they, you know, maybe already in their closet to waterfowl hunt in? I mean, we're already doing that anyways, yeah. haven't been doing that for years. It works great, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was, it's, it was a convergence there. And I think we're, you know, we're happy with that decision right now. And uh, we are, I think Kevin mentioned that before, we are, we are offering a, a solid across a lot of the apparel, uh, a couple solids in some things, but there's a, uh, a darker like ash color ash ash is the color um almost like the gadwall you know that's that's above your head there so you know it's kind of a darker brown gray um that like if it's you know if you're if you're trying to hunker down in a in a in a in a blind where it's super dark or you know maybe in the shadows of a bunch of flooded timber and stuff like that solid is going to be is going to be is going to be awesome as well and a lot of guys like to wear solids for waterfowl and so we wanted to also provide that opportunity for our customers. 100%. And that's me. I, I already have some of it and actually was using it last year. And it's so it, it's it's perfect already. I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Yeah. It's got – solids has gotten really, really popular. And, uh, in fact, I think it's kind of – it may be a fad thing, but, you know, back in the day when there wasn't all these patterns and stuff, um, that's what our – you know, grandfathers, great grandfathers were using, you know, and uh, they killed ducks. So, but at the same time, 100%. going back to a pattern like Velo, you know, like, um, I'm not just saying this, like I've said this for a long time is that's my favorite pattern um, in the lineup, just in general, yeah. you know, like you gotta, you gotta match the hatch and you gotta <laughs> wear what you need to wear in the situation. Right. Yeah. But like you said, you got your, your toolies um, later in the, as the season progresses, those get brown. You got your your river bottoms. You go in a, a, a dry field hunt, you know, with wheat, cut wheat yeah. and all that, perfect match again. Yeah. So uh, it's – and then just the the ability to have all those pieces already at your access. Just I'm kind of repeating everything you said, but just to add my two cents and think it's it's such a perfect match. Yeah. And, and a, lot of, a, a lot of brands like to come out with new patterns. Uh, it's – oftentimes a, a sales driver and so mm -hmm, um but sure. again like what we're talking about um in the overall scheme of things we would like this to be better for our customer than we would 
for anything yeah. else. So when we think about, you know, having to make these people buy all new sets or, I mean, we're not going to, I mean, we already think, we, we, we believe that Velo is the most versatile pattern I, that we have. And so, again, if it, if it works, Ayers nail, hit the nail on the head. Does a camouflage pattern have to be species-based? And the answer is no. And no. do we have to release a new camo pattern to get into waterfowl? The answer is no. And so, uh, you know, if you've got Velo stuff already, uh, good news. Uh, it all matches. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's so that's an awesome uh, answer yeah it is because you you like you said you're thinking about the the customer and if it if it's not broke why fix it you know so i that's a great point great point um i don't know if we kind of cut i almost semi feel like i'm like wanting to get into the waiters so bad i'm oh. trying to get there but yeah um can I don't know if we I feel like we kind of answered this. Can you explain, you know, the concept? Didn't we kind of go yeah, into this already? So. so we'll just move on. We'll go into uh, – I kind of want to know, and I know you could probably do a whole podcast on this, and maybe you guys could come on again later, but in a shorter form, uh, what does the gear testing look like for Kuyu for a product that finally gets approved? Like I've been curious about that for years. What do you guys do? Where do you do it? How do you do it? You know, how does that look? I'll tell you, yeah, I guess I'll, you know, jump in yeah. on, on this one. Yeah. yeah, jump in, Kevin, anything you, anything you want on this. But uh, like a lot of times it, it really, it starts with materials testing. And so, uh, like I said, with some of the waterfowl uh, fabrics, you know, we've got four or five years into testing these, these fabrics and working on different combinations. And we'll put them into like an existing silhouette, like an existing jacket. Like you might put it into a set of Yukon rain gear and then start, you know, start, start testing it, getting out, um, you know, getting, getting a set of like just fabric test samples out to, you know, half dozen guys, for example, and, and start getting them timing and getting their feedback on it. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to actually prototype testing, I mean, it, it really like the length of time that that takes is, you know, at the shortest, I'd say it's, you know, closer to, close to two years. And at the longest, it mm -hmm. could be, or five years. I mean, it's, you know, I'd say like, you know, something like a waiter, like that's been, that's been through, you know, four years, the four years we've been working on, you know, different mm -hmm. ideas around, like just, you know, and, and different options and testing those. Um, we certainly leverage our, our guides and outfitters. Uh, we've got a lot of guys, like internal employees that hunt really hard and are getting out on hunts. We've got, um, you know, customers that aren't necessarily employees but they're you know they're guys that, that we trust they give really great feedback know every product we make know other products from other companies too that that we can get it in their hands and like we'll try to keep track of you know who's going on what hunt when get it in their hands mm. get it you know get it tested uh, you know sometimes like you know if we get it the right color sometimes we can even slip it in on hunts that you know maybe filmed enough for other reasons or something you know it's like there's, there's stuff in the background going on all the time that like sometimes you don't you don't see but i mean that the cameraman may be wearing full full prototypes why the, the subject in the you know the film might be you know having to wear the production stuff you know it's like <laughs> those kind of those kind of scenarios so um you know we definitely take advantage of and it's and it really depends on you know how much testing we feel like we need to validate the product and we don't go to market until we feel confident that it that it's at a place that it's you know going to perform the way we want it and and you know not fail essentially because it's you know that's yeah. that's not an option um, especially with a company yeah. that's built on right. sheep hunting where you know you're dropped off in the Yukon for ten days and need to live off your back like it's you know it's it's it needs to perform. Yeah. Do you yeah. follow up on it, that, Kevin? Yeah. yeah, I. It's funny, um, you know, he said that sometimes the cameraman, I mean, oftentimes I think me and Ayers have conversations we're like, hey, do you care if this is in a picture or a video? And we're like, not really. And so people generally don't even perceive it. I think some people do. If you keep track of some of the Facebook Kuyu pages, I, I like to watch it because some of those people are pretty astute as to what's different. But oftentimes in a lot of our stuff, you'll see wear test items just a little bit tricky on on what yeah. it looks like um but you know and he touched on it but 
that guide and outfitter program, uh, again, not only from a wear test perspective, but also just from an overall program is something that we hold very high here at Kuyu and has been something since the very beginning that has helped us grow into the brand that we are. So, um, you know, anytime we can utilize people that are in the field the most out of anybody, then that's who we're going to use. Um, because those are the people that are going to break it the fastest. And the whole point of wear testing is to try to break it so that when a consumer buys it, they don't. Um, so that's one thing, you know, we, we talk about very often is, is our authenticity and the idea that when we come to market with something, it's tested and proven. There have been numerous times, um, and I dare say that we're in one of those moments right now in which there are products that have been ready to launch for a while, uh, not for what we're talking about today, but in the background that have been years in the making that are being pushed and pushed and pushed because something's just not quite right. And so it does yeah. hurt the overall business. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is that when somebody buys that rain gear or when somebody buys us, buys that insulation piece and it's ultra light that they don't get cold in it and they don't get wet in the rain gear and, you know, the tent doesn't leak, all these things. And if you think about the, the mm -hmm. broad, the broad swath, we always say we're a mm -hmm. full stack hunting brand because we're about the only brand out there that goes truly from the bottom of your foot to the top of your head plus packs, plus bino harnesses, plus tents. We're really the only one in that space. And so when you think about all the testing that has to happen for those products to consistently come out <clears throat> top of the line every time, it takes years. Mm -hmm. Not, not so good, too, because I think some people think like, oh, companies just come out with all these different pieces and it's just, you know, for more money and this and this and that. But it's, that's not even the case. It's like the to stay consistent across all of those different pieces and to know that each one of those pieces is 100% ready and bomb proof like that's that's really impressive yep are we there yet so are i we, think i think we we're at here the moment? <laughs> if we're if we're good for it um <laughs> let's let's dive into the waiters um i unfortunately wasn't able to to, to look at them yet but so <laughs> i'm wanting to know just as bad or more than the people that's going to watch the podcast um yeah please go into detail about the waiters and uh the design behind it and and everything yeah and i think that i mean the waiters has been a project that's the one of the longest we've ever undertaken and just in terms of, and and, and I'd say probably the most, yeah, the most testing hours we've ever put into a product as well. Like we, we wanted to make sure that this was, you know, that we were making something that, that guys could rely on for, for usage for years. And just, you know, it's like, <laughs> I did say the analogy, but almost like, you know, build the Toyota truck of waiters, so, you know, where, where you just, you could rely on it, you know, and it's, it's not, it's not going to fail you. And so, you know, it's um, from a material standpoint, like definitely, tons of innovation there, like materials. And we, we went with a boot foot on this uh, waiter, uh, just warmer, more comfortable in general, more convenient, uh, but really put a ton of focus in design of like, what is that boot? How does that boot perform? What does it feel like? What does it fit like? Um, the upper on the upper on the waiter, like materials are massively important. And uh, one of the two materials in, in the upper of the waiter is actually uh, one of the same materials that we put in that, that storm shell jacket. And I already mentioned that before. So it's an incredibly puncture and abrasion resistant material, like a full four layer laminate with incredible, um, not only waterproofness, but you know, it's got breathability characteristics in it. Uh, the, the waiter is actually panelized for durability. So the upper and like the gusset area are the same fabric that's used in the, in the, the hard shell, um, the storm shell jacket. And that's actually got some, some stretch characteristics to it. And so it'll move with your body. And then the, the way we panelized it, like we tried to minimize the amount of seams, but the whole area all the way down from around your knee, all the way up your, through your seat, like a bunch of that are all like one panel. So there's like minimized seams to that whole area. And that's actually a thicker double weave fabric that, uh, that's got even more like strength durability in those areas. And, uh, 
and yeah, I guess going back to, you know, going back to the boot, uh, neoprene insulation inside of it, uh, thought like really, really carefully and put a ton of design work into mud release. Cause there's nothing worse than being out there and you know foot deep mud and having your waders pull off like like we wanted something that was a boot that was incredibly comfortable and so like the outsole is if you look at the design it looks it it's, was influenced from a mountain bike tire and so it's like a lot of open space like all the lugs are designed so that literally like if you get it caked with mud like it just peels off or you spray it with a hose it just you know boom mud's gone out of it and so then when you're walking it's also not catching and then like the, the, the whole boot design, like we didn't flare out the, the sole of it. So it would like work like a suction cup. You know, every, you see like everything's just like straight down, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it comes out of the mud really easily. Uh, mm. Put a ton of effort into finding the right uh, like last shape and, and uh, a really good fit for the boot as well. So it's really comfortable and then made it stiff enough. Also, it's got like a three quarter shank in it. So that when your foot's flexing a ton in the mud, it's not going to, it's not going to like just wear your feet out, you know, or damn like it. Like, so it, like having some structure in that, in that outsole is, is, is really important. And uh, like, I was actually shocked at, um, at how warm the, that boot ended up being. Like we had guys testing uh, up in Montana and, you know, using it in even like, sub-zero type of temperatures and they're and they're calling up and going like no nah, my feet were fine which i was like i was i was honestly blown away like at how at how well it performed in mm. in the cold so um you know, the whole fabric the whole upper of the wader is a, is is waterproof breathable fabric like i said it's that the four layer um but then that that boot foot it transitions it it also like we put a lot of work into the transition so it goes like vulcanized rubber on the bottom like good support in the bottom then it transitions into neoprene and we actually printed the neoprene as well in camo. And then, and then it transitions into that fabric in a way that doesn't bunch. Like a lot of waders, like, you know, you'll have this big clunky boot foot that's like jamming against your, your shins, the fabrics folding down inside. Like, it's just, you know, it's awful. Yeah. And like, these are, these just like the whole part that's actually articulating and moving with your leg is, is really, uh, really, you know, is super super comfortable uh there's a like that boot also has a checkered uh fabric on the inside that that allows for airflow because you've got breathable upper but then you've got the boot foot that's neoprene and not breathable and so you got to figure out how to get like that moisture out of there and so you know thought really thoughtful about like the lining material that we put in the boot also in terms of uh you know in terms of airflow out of it and then as you move up, uh, like really good stretch, like super thick um, stretch waist um, belt on it with a couple different tracks. So you can, uh, you know, so it doesn't, doesn't, so it kind of fits different body shapes. Um, you know, the little attention to detail of things are annoying. Like, you know, you take off your belt and it falls through a belt loop and drives you crazy. Next time you try to put it back yeah. on, like position the belt loops, so that doesn't happen. You know, just like those kind of, that kind of attention to detail. Yeah. Yep. And then moving up like through the chest area, um, like the, the pocket system, uh, there's like a pass through hand pocket that's got a, a fleecy liner in it. Um, it's got an outer st stash pocket that's got like will hold nine shells going across. So you can you can organize some shells, you know, if you're ever needing to like go chase down a bird or you just want to be stay a little more organized with your shells. Um, you can keep some in, in that location. And then, um, you know, things like D-rings up there, you can hang stuff off of. Um, the harness system, we actually uh, took the design from our uh, vinyl harness and used that on the back because we knew it was super supportive, fit really, really well. But then we transitioned into like elastic through this section and we built the buckle system so that the tag end of that, that whole harness system, the tag end falls down inside the waiter. So there's none of this like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like the tag end sticking up and then you have to put another big piece of hardware here and all of a sudden your gun hits it and you miss your bird because you know because your gun's not mounting right like yep. you know literally you just have a piece of like thin elastic like coming down through your shooting area here so mm -hmm. and i think uh anything you want to add on that uh kevin or any questions you guys have so far i can talk 
I keep going. Well, don't you have a, and I believe there's a cinch, there's a cinch at the top too, correct? Super good point. Yeah, exactly. So that's something you don't see in a lot of waders because, you know, like, Mm. obviously, you know, starts light raining. If you have debris falling in there, like wanted that upper to be able to cinch close to your body. And so put a cinch around the upper, the upper hem. So up here, like Mm. you can like cinch on both sides and you can constrict that down, which just makes kind of makes the whole experience better in terms of performance. Like I said, it keeps debris from falling in your waders. It keeps, you know, some light rain out if it starts raining. Um, you know, it's not catching on everything, having a bunch of extra fabric for, you know, if you have a waiter that's big enough for, for all that layering. Yeah. And, and those are the more important reasons, right? But to add on to, it's just cleaner looking too. I mean, you see some that's just, it's just puffed out at the top and it's just like sloppy. That's a very minor reason, but all yours are obviously more important. But it's just there's a lot of good reasons why I was actually when I seen that I thought, man, this is this pretty um, useful idea in many ways that you already named. Um, Kevin, do you have any more to add to the just the design of the waiters and the waiters themselves before we move on to some some of the other questions? No, no, I don't. I think Ayers kind of described everything about them, so. I think and you all yeah that was a, that was great that was I think I, I mean yeah, like honestly like one of the really important things though is like I said we wanted this we wanted to be confident in the manufacturing of this waiter we wanted to be confident in the waterproofness of the waiter we wanted to be confident in the seam taping the boot attachment everything and so we actually collaborated with Sims Fishing out of Bozeman Montana to help make this waiter for us. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, anybody who's in the fly fishing space knows Sims waders, knows the quality of their waders. Like they're our manufacturing partner for this. They're also going to be, I mean, we'll be the point of contact for any, you know, if a warranty issue comes up or something like that, but like, like long-term like repair, any warranty issues, like they've got the facilities to fix it all, fix it fast and fix it right. If anything mm-hmm. comes up. That, le- that leads me out perfectly right into that was our next question was basically going into a little bit about the warranty and what it looks like. Um, you know, yeah, could you just divulge a little bit more about that? Let's say, you know, this guy's had his waders a couple of years and maybe he wants some new tread on his boots or maybe he fell, you know, walking across the bush and he fell and hit, you know, went into a sharp stick or so, something, just whatever, say the worst happens, what's, what will that warranty look like in, um, yeah. Kevin, do you want to, do you want to talk just about like warranty in general with Kuyu and like our philosophy on that? And just, you know, like, and then I can talk a little more specifically about, um, you know, waiter yeah. warranty. Yeah. And I know, I know, um, I do know that the waiter warranty is the same as the Sims warranty. So, um, if you become accustomed to how they handle their waiters, uh, that is how, the, the Kuyu waiter will also be handled. Um, but for our, for our waiter, you know, I mean, for our warranty program, we actually have an individual dedicated to warranty at, at Kuyu. Uh, and that's what he does uh, full time, which is, which is great. You know, we definitely warranty. I, we would try our best to, to do what's right by the consumer um, when it comes to warranty. And sometimes, especially in very specific situations, it might be, uh, depending on the situation, what happened, and, well, how we would take care of somebody. But we always try our best to, to lean on the, uh, on the side of the consumer. We, we, we do have a, um, a, uh, a fairly, you know, I'm trying to figure out the right word to say here without saying too much. Um, <laughs> Ayers, do, why, why, don't, why don't you jump into that real quick? Because I, I, I'd rather talk about the waiters than we talk about the overall warranty. Oh, yeah, 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 no problem. No, I think that's, I mean, I think, I think the bottom line is like, you know, if you have any issues with the waiters, we want to hear about it. We want to know. Um, like, my, like my job and a lot of people in the products are like, we're always trying to put the warranty guy out of business. Like, I mean, that is, that is, our, that is, that is one of our yeah, goals yeah. in life, you know? And so, um, <laughs> but... We yeah. like we will stand behind this waiter, any leakage, any like any issues that you that the customer has. And if you know, if it's something that's just a, a wear and tear type of issue that's over years and developed and like there's pinhole things like that, you know, that might have developed over years, like 
they can be repaired at a really, really reasonable fee. Like it's like, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be not something that's going to put you off at all. And so like you, you plan on, on getting years and years of, of usage out of these waders for sure. Yeah. Cause that's kind of a, I mean, we got to ask that question, right? Cause that's what everyone's going to ask. We all want to know that question. Yeah. How is it? The, but, the, but your mindset is, look at, we made something that we hope we're not having any plans for you to be sitting in the back or saying, oh, we got leaks everywhere. My boots leak, my feet are wet, you know, my crotch is wet, whatever. The, your whole goal. So I, I totally understand from that side of you. And I think, um, like you said, when you guys stand behind your product, uh, if there is an issue, if there happens to be something, there's no doubt you're going to take care of it. But when you talk about a four-layered waiter that's one of them probably sounds like one of the toughest waiters out on the market um there's probably not going to be a lot of issues yeah and we've got we've got literally thousands of hours of, of testing into you know this fabric and this waiter mm -hmm. specifically and so we you know we're, we're happy with where it's at in terms of you know long-term durability and it like i said yeah, like everything everything is re everything is repairable on it like you can literally like we could get we could put new boots on your waiters like it's you know that can be done easily by six. Okay. Like it's, you know, if there's, okay. if there's some kind of yeah. problem there, like, so there's a long-term kind of solution and repair option for, for everything. Mm. Perfect. You said something about speed a little bit ago. You said they'll, they'll get it done pretty quick. I mean, I'm, I'm not really technically asking for a timeline, but I mean, when you say quick, is that two months quick? Is that is there agreed upon yeah. time frame that you guys have? That's with Sims? It. Yeah, no, that's a good question. We had we were having that conversation, and we were really trying to target being like three week time type of time frame uh, to get things turned around. Mm -hmm. um, we it's a new it's a new, pro, new program for us. That's our target. That's our goal. Uh, we don't want to leave guys. We understand how you know how important it is, like, and how reliant guys are obviously on the waiters, and so. Um, so we, yeah, we, there's, a, there's a lot in the background that's going on warranty wise, and we're going to make sure that people are, are happy. Now, do you have uh, like, say if something happens out in the field, do you guys got something that you have for that to be able to do quick in the field fix? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, we have like a no so patch or a small patch. I mean, you can put little, you know, bits of like aqua seal on there. There's things like that. I mean, if it's a bigger, if it's a big gash or something like that, we'd prefer that you actually like talk to us about it, and we'll try to figure out the best way to get it repaired right for you. Uh, mm -hmm. But in general, like like okay. holes there actually you... through the fabric itself were were really not not common at all through any of the wear test period. So yeah, it was it was mm -hmm. it was good. Mm -hmm. Anything else you can add to that side of it as far as the warranty and stuff like that goes and the wear and tear of the waders? Not for the, I think the waiter side of things is, is good. Obviously when it comes to warranty earlier, when you asked me that question, uh, I, <laughs> I live on a really long driveway and normally nobody's here cause it's kind of late right now. And my dog was going nuts. And so I was wondering <laughs> if I needed to go check what was going on. So sorry for the, <laughs> The little pause there on the I was like kind of confused and I could hear him barking and I was like if somebody come up to my house so I was a little thrown off by that but huh. you know um again when it comes to the warranty at Kuyu it is you know for the general warranty side of things we do have a full-time guy doing that and it is for the original uh consumer purchaser and it lasts the lifetime of a product and it is against manufacturer worksmanship. So sometimes people might call in and say, hey, you know, well, normally people don't tell us how they broke products. But, um, you know, if, it, if we find out it was used in a manner that it was not intended for, which sometimes happens, um, we do have the right to void that warranty. That rarely happens mm -hmm. for Kuyu products. Uh, but I did want to mm -hmm. go ahead and throw that out there because we were talking about overall warranty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that makes that makes complete sense. Yeah, and understandable. So, we'll get get to wrapping this up. We've kept you guys on here for quite a while, but um, it's late there. I know you're you're ahead of time there uh, in Wyoming, Kevin. But what's the future look like for QU's Warfowl line? I mean, is this what's introduced this year? I mean, I kind of know the answers to this, but what's introduced this year is that it? Because there's so much stuff. I mean, you're coming out with a lot 
I mean, you, like you said, you got the full gamut. I mean, is there, what's it look like for the future? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not going to stop. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, we're already, I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot, there's already a lot in the hopper for, you know, like we said, it takes years to develop the stuff yeah. that we just mm-hmm. launched. So we're, you know, let's just leave it at we're developing stuff. Yeah. And yeah, no, I mean, no, I'm just, I'm just, you know, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, we, got we more can't have coming for the waterfowl category. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, you know how interviewers are. They got to try to sneak those those little sneaky questions in trying <laughs> to get stuff out. <laughs> and no, like, I mean, <laughs> yeah, good. I'd love to, yeah. you know, love to get, you know, if you guys get you guys in the product and testing more, like, you know, love to get everybody's feedback on that and love your customer feedback. And, and it's going to be, it's going to be a fun ride. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we're definitely committed to, to this category. Um, like I said, with it, these are these are products that that you know set the bar kind of into, to a new level, and it's definitely a new like mm-hmm. you know, like level of innovation for Kuyu that we haven't seen you know for a long time. And so yeah, it's it, it's super exciting. And so um, yeah, I'm just excited for, for everybody to try it out. Yeah, and that's not easy to do. So setting a new standard is is saying something. So we're excited. And, uh, uh, you know, seeing what you guys are doing is pretty astounding and, and watching that. So uh, when you see people taking serious what they do and putting the time in, you, passionate. You, yeah, you got to, you got to, you know, nod your your head to that, tip your cap to that. So, well, um, anything else you guys want to add to uh, to end this podcast? Appreciate no. your time. Thanks for having us You guys us answered on. questions great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having yeah, us Yeah, thank on you guys so much. About it. I mean, we're excited yeah. about it. We, we feel very good about the lineup and uh, where we stand when it comes to this waterfowl product line. So, again, really appreciate you guys having us on and talking through everything. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks for all the info. You guys detailed everything very well. Thank you. Yeah. All right, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you guys on the next one. All right.